Hey, welcome back. It's a Thursday Thursday on Liquid Lunch. Just banging through hour two today on this Thursday Thursday. We're coming to you from the Newsmax headquarters in Midtown Manhattan and uh, downtown at the NYSE. The market is taking a little bit on the chin uh, down just up, as we speak up 65 points back in the green. Uh, and I think the market should be kind of stabilized at these levels till after Labor Day. It's kind of in a holding pattern, if you ask me. And uh, join us to start this uh, second hour off after uh, the Dungies. We go back to politics and policy. We're bringing Rafael Mangual, who's joined us before. He's a uh, deputy fellow of uh, legal policy at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor to City Journal. And uh, thanks for joining us again, thanks my so friend. Thanks for having me. I'm happy we could have you. I'm, we had, yeah. I'm happy we had a pen yes. uh, for you. <laughs> <laughs> But um, not everybody gets that, by I the way. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I could have made you hold this pen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that might not be helpful yeah. to uh, your objectivity. <laughs> but um, so uh, talk to us about the Garner effect and w- w- what's happening here. Yeah. Two different law enforcement bodies looked into this thing That's and right. said nothing to see here. That's right. But well, yet he gets fired. Well, here's the thing, right? I mean, the standards are different. When it's when you're considering criminal charges, what you're looking for is whether a crime was committed. That's a much higher standard of proof that you have to meet. So it is possible that someone could do something that is worthy of some sort of employment level discipline, but doesn't rise to the level of a crime, right? But you know, the, the thing that we have to, I think, worry about is the broader context in which the Garner thing happened, right? It's happening at a time where police are just encountering unbelievable amounts of pushback in the street. I mean, getting doused with buckets of water, Chinese food being shot at from rooftops in Brooklyn. Um, you know, it's coming at a time where the NYPD is, is going through the midst of a suicide crisis, mm-hmm. right? That's demoralizing in and of itself. Um, and it's also happening in the context of a presidential campaign of which Mayor de Blasio is a part. And because of all those things together, it's, it's not uh, hard to see why some in the NYPD may see this as like a political kind of calculation in the firing as as an embodiment of the political moment. And when when you have all those things come together, what, what the risk is, is that the NYPD will start to understand and internalize that, that sense of, of antagonism coming from the left in particular and start to back off. And if that happens, things can go wrong. Well, so we heard a lot about uh, the f- so-called Freddie Gray effect right. in Baltimore and the so-called Ferguson effect in uh, Missouri. Uh, is the Garner effect the same thing? It's just police wanting to be less proactive and less uh, aggressive? I think we're going to have to wait and see, right? Um, you know, there have been some communications from the union down to the rank and file, you know, uh, hinting at, you know, maybe you shouldn't be as aggressive out in the street. And it's, it's certainly possible that we'll see what's called a slowdown here um, in New York City. Now, the thing to remember, though, is when you look at examples like Baltimore, Chicago, Uh, St. Louis, where crime really went up in the wake of these slowdowns, you have to remember that New York City is not as vulnerable Mm. to those kinds of shifts in policing than those other cities were, right? We are coming on the back of 25 straight years of progress um, when it comes to keeping crime down. That doesn't get undone overnight. That doesn't get undone in a year. Uh, Last time we had you on, Rafael, you unloaded both barrels on Donald (laughs) Trump for his criminal justice proposal. Now, I couldn't imagine your face when Bernie Sanders unveiled his criminal justice reform vote. Because right. you thought the Trump program was way too liberal, for lack of a better description. Explain to us what Bernie Sanders' plan is and tell us why you think it's a good or bad idea. Sure. Well, first I'll say there were some, there were some good things about the First Step Act. Right? Yeah, I wasn't totally didn't, he, didn't hear to that it. from you. Well, well, totally yeah, I, 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 I learned something. and I hope everybody at home, we're always trying to get them to learn, but I learned something that there are crimes that are deemed nonviolent. That's right. Um, but there's really a lot of violence involved in that. So I, I, I thought your points on that were very educational I myself because, uh, you know, some of those people, maybe they really were nonviolent, sure. like small amounts of weed and stuff sure. when there was crazy penalties. But people didn't realize, you know, child harassment and some of those right. stuff is pretty violent. That's right. Yeah, look, I mean, actually, one of the most interesting things about Sanders' plan is the tension uh, with the First Step Act, which is kind of the most... The so biggest. what is the Sanders plan? Well, what are the, the Sanders plan is, is 6,000 words. It is a kind of coverall basis type of plan. It really is kind of a... a, a he's living in a dream world. I mean, none of these things are going to happen. 
Um, I mean, for, for one, right, the, the, the sort of goals that he wants to achieve, like a 50% reduction in the incarcerated population, a lot of those goals can't be achieved without making serious changes at the state level, which we know because of federalism, the federal government has very little power to change. Right. right? Uh, also, you can't enact a lot of these reforms without the help of Congress, which uh, he is unlikely to get. I mean, I think there's a reason why it took so long to get something as mild as the First Step Act, mild compared to what Sanders is proposing, um, to, to get that through Congress. So I, I think he's living in a dream world if he thinks even a quarter of this plan is going to see the light of day in the form of actually becoming policy. But there's some really, really concerning things, starting with the 50 percent reduction in incarceration goal. There is no way to achieve that kind of reduction in incarceration without letting out very serious offenders, very chronic offenders, very violent offenders, right? The majority of people in state prisons, which is where about 90% of all prisoners reside, are in for violent crimes. Even the ones that aren't in for violent crimes tend to have violent criminal records, violent disciplinary histories within prison, right? Getting into fights and that right. sort of thing, and are, are likely, you know, How, at least adjacent to give, violent give, give our audience a sense of recidivism with sure. violent criminals like what wh 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 how high is that well actually violent criminal recidivism if you define it as people who are getting out from an, a term of incarceration for a violent crime tend to actually be lower than hmm. some of the recidivism rates for other offenders but again there's a lot of overlap between so-called violent and non-violent criminals so i kind of always pull back at the suggestion that you can accurately characterize someone into one of those buckets but the recidivism rate for a state prisoners who were, who were released from terms of imprisonment is 83%. Over they're coming back. Come, well, not necessarily coming back, but they're getting rearrested. Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm saying well, they're, 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 they're coming back to the criminal right. justice system that's right. in some way, that's 83% right. of the time. Well, well, so some folks may say that maybe that goes to prove we need to do a better job rehabilitating Absolutely. prisoners. Absolutely. We ought to do a better job rehabilitating. We ought to be exploring what works. The problem is, is that a lot of these uh, you know, sort of criminal justice reformers start from the proposition that we know what works, that we know how mm. to achieve lower levels of recidivism on a broad scale. We don't. Right? There are some recidivism programs that work, but they tend to involve a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling. They tend to involve a long period of time in which people are, are, are sort of engaging in those programs. You can't scale that across an incarcerated population of 2.2 million people. Now, my personal favorite presidential candidate happens to, of course, be Andrew Yang, because I could use that extra thousand dollars a month <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. But he unveiled a criminal justice reform plan of his own. What's included in that? Do we know? I, I mean, a, lot of, a lot of the same. I have taking as detailed a look at his plan as, as, as Sanders's plan or, or, um, or Biden's plan, for example. But they're all basically starting from the general proposition that the criminal justice system can be fairly characterized on the whole as overly punitive, as irredeemably racist. They start from this uh, idea that we are suffering from a mass incarceration problem. And these are premises which I think are false um, and I think are inevitably going to lead to bad policy. I mean, another example from the Sanders plan that really kind of sticks in my craw because there's evidence to suggest why it's a bad idea is his proposal to ban punitive segregation, better known as solitary confinement, altogether across the board. First of all, he can't do that in state prisons okay. because that's a state matter. But even if he were to do that, that's a that's the evidence suggests that that is not a good thing for the safety of inmates. We have an experiment on that here in New York City where Mayor de Blasio... It was just a riot in the, yeah. in the tombs yeah. last week. Well, Mayor de Blasio... Um, we have a great real-life experiment. Yeah. Epstein was... Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> ...found dead that's I I alone. That's right. <laughs> that's right. But, you know, when it comes to punitive segregation, it is a valuable tool for corrections officers to keep inmates incapacitated, even within jail walls, where they do tend to engage in high levels of violence. And when Mayor de Blasio took solitary confinement off the table for inmates 21 and under here in New York City, violence spiked. Of course. 20 years ago, we had about double the jail population that New York City has today. We had the same number of guards that we have today, more or less. But we have double the violence today than we did in 1998 when crime in New York City was much higher. That the reason for that, I think, at least in significant part, is his his taking of, of solitary, solitary confinement off the table because you can't. What are you going to do to us? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can keep backing there's, up. There's no we, stick. We can't get right. Exactly. We, we we can't get thrown in the hole. That's right. Basically. That's right. It's like you it know, telling your kid, you, you do that again, you're going to get punished. That's right. Um, and you never punish the kid, then they just keep doing it. Eventually so, yeah, they figure I mean, it out. It's, it's not to um, say every criminal is like a kid, but correct. Um, I, I'm really uh, interested about the 83% recidivism because you would think 
uh, anyone who says they know how to control recidivism and we're at 83%, uh, right. we're it's not right. controlling it. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, yeah, like I said, you know, there have been some smaller scale experiments that are encouraging, but most of those things that have been successful are very, very hard to scale. We have a relatively large prison population, as we know, in this country. You need something that is scalable. And until we have that, I think policymakers have a, a, an extraordinary responsibility to uh, to the general public to keep them safe and that I think the best way that we know how to do that is by incapacitating criminals and keeping them locked up um, when they deserve to be. Fantastic. Uh, Rafael Mengual joins us today, um, Deputy Director of uh, Deputy uh, Fellow, uh, Fellow and Deputy Director of Legal Policy at the Manhattan Institute, contributor to City Journal and uh, one of our men on the street, boots on the ground uh, experts when it comes to uh, criminal justice reform. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank you. it. Liquid Lunch, back right after this.